I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness, right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Well, <laughs> little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine. How are you? I'm just fine, too, thank you. I, I've been in suspense all week. Well, why are you in suspense? Well, remember Captain Hook last week found out where Peter Pan's hideout is? Yes. And I'm just so worried whether he'll capture Peter Pan and all the boys and girls in Neverland. You know, I've been worrying about that myself. Well, could we please read the comics quick, fast now, so we can find out right away? Fuck the comic weekly? Yes. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, under Bringing Up Father, Beetle Bailey. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. <whistles> toot me a toot and tweet me a tweedle. Squeeze out music for Bailey the Beetle. <whistles> We're out at the army camp where Beetle and his friends are stationed. The sergeant is having problems. A soldier runs into his office... <whistles> Oh, Sarge, Sarge, I got a splinter in my finger. <laughs> and then another guy dashes in. Hey, Sarge, Beetle climbed on the roof to get our baseball and caught his foot in the gutter. Well, tell him to take off his shoe. I'll be out in a minute. Okay, Sarge. Hey, Beetle, the Sarge says you should take off the shoe. Sarge picks up a pair of tweezers and turns to the first soldier. All right, now, hold still. I'll pull out this splinter. Now go easy, Sarge. I got a weak heart. Now, please don't hurt me. Please don't hurt me. I don't want to hurt my foot. Third picture, top row. The sergeant comes out of his headquarters. You give me back that ping pong ball. I didn't get your ping pong ball. You did too. I saw you take my ping pong ball. He sees two soldiers ball. fighting. Hey, hey, stop that fighting. Stop it. Yeah, buddy. I did not. Oh, shut up. Just then, another soldier approaches him. Oh, Sarge, can I have a pass to visit my sick cousin? A sister, yes. A mother, yes. A grandmother, yes. But a cousin, no. At that moment, something falls from the roof. Last picture, top row, it hits the sergeant. Oh! <laughs> Hello, Sarge. It's Beetle, whose foot was caught in the gutter and who had loosened his shoe and fell out of it. First picture, bottom row, the sergeant gets up, clutching his aching back. Oh, will I ever get out of here alive? He sees two G.I.s monkeying with the water hose. Hey, you guys, stop playing with that hose! The guy holding the hose turns around, pointing the hose at the Sarge. Hey, hey, what the... What do you say, Sarge? Turn that thing off! Oh, excuse it, Sarge, I lost my head. <laughs> well, I'll lose mine if I don't get out of this army. The sergeant goes inside his headquarters again. He grabs a towel. Oh, I'll have to go home and change clothes. Just then... A ball sails through the window, and... Last picture, the sergeant comes home. He's soaking wet, covered with bruises, his face bandaged. He looks just like he feels, a nervous wreck. His wife greets him. Well, I'm glad you're home early. Oh, what a day I've had with the children. Oh, shut up! Wasn't that funny? Every time the sergeant turned around, something happened to him. Yes, and when he comes in the house looking like a wreck, his wife, who's sitting in a chair, complains about her day. I don't know why she should complain. Children aren't as much trouble as soldiers in the army. Oh, I'm sure they're not. I'm not sure you really mean that. Well, we won't argue about that now. Now, would you like to read Peter Pan? Oh, I love to read Peter Pan. I won't argue about that. All right, then. Let's turn over the page. Go past little iodine on page two, past Prince Val on page three, turn over that page. And there's Peter Pan. Yes, that little pixie who lives in Neverland, the place where little boys go who don't want to grow up. And last week, Captain 
looks at me and Pirate, Trick Peter's friend Tinkerbell into telling him where Peter's hideout was. Yes, and Captain Hook followed Tinkerbell's directions and came right to the spot and was standing outside the entrance to Peter's hideout last week when we left him. I wonder what's going to happen. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Peter Pan. Say the magic words with me. Pirates, Pirates crocodiles, crocodiles, Peter Pie Pan, Pan. Whisk, whisk up music, music for Never Never, Never Land. Land. Wendy has told her brothers, John and Michael, that it's time to leave Neverland and return home to London. All the other boys decide to go with him. As they go up the stairs, Peter snaps, All right, go on, go on, go back and be a grown-up, see if I care. Sadly, Wendy goes up the stairs. And out the trapdoor. And third picture top row, she's seized by pirates as she emerges from Hangman's tree. Bind her and gag her. Last picture top row, Wendy sees that the boys have been captured by the pirates, too. First picture bottom row, Hook snarls, Away with them, men! And the pirates take the children away. And now Hook takes a package in his hand. And now, Smee, to take care of Master Peter Pan. Uh, uh, but, but the captain, wouldn't it be more humane, like, to slit his throat? Aye, it would, Smee, but I've given me word to Tinkerbell not to lay a finger or a hook on Peter Pan. <laughs> and Hook starts to lower a package down the hollow tree. <laughs> Captain Hook never breaks a promise, Smee. <laughs> the package lands at the bottom. Peter sees it and picks it up. He finds a note on it. To Peter, with love, from Wendy. Hmm. Oh, isn't that terrible? All the children are captured by Captain Hook's pirates. Yes. I wonder what's in that package. A bomb? I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Oh, my. I hope Peter doesn't open it, because then it will explode. Well, we'll find out about that next week. Now look across the page to page five. There's Roy Rogers. And you remember last week the farmers, led by a man named Trent, had found Scarecrow Katie's hideout and captured Roy and that nice old man. And they were going to hang Roy and the old man Katie because they thought Katie had been the leader of the cattlemen on the raids on their farm. Oh, this is terrible. Will something happen in time to save Roy's life? Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers, king of the cowboys. Hi yip by oh Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. Hi yip by oh <laughs> Two of the farmers hold guns at Roy and Katie's backs, making ready to hang them. Trent, the leader of the farmers, orders... All right, Rogers, march. Katie's daughter, Oriole, in a desperate attempt to save their lives, quietly opens the cage that holds Katie's falcon, a hunting bird who is trained to attack anyone who mistreats her master. The falcon sees the cages open and darts out. She heads straight for Trent, dives for his head, and scratches at his eyes. The man with the other gun turns toward the bird. Hey, it's a falcon, Trent. Keep your head down. In the confusion, Oreo darts to Roy, a knife in her hand, and cuts the ropes that bind his wrist. A second later, Roy has snatched Trent's rifle off the ground. Last picture top row, he orders, All right, Katie, call off your bird. I got these men covered. Oreo will cut your dad loose. All right, come back here now, lady. Come on, black lady. Hey, you men. You keep those hands up. First picture bottom row, the bird flies to Katie. He turns to Roy. Hey, Roy, we got to convince Trent here. It ain't me who raids the Nestor's farms. How can we do it? Well, I think here comes Trent's son with the answer. And sure enough, it is Pug Trent who has ridden off in pursuit of Snapper Sloan, leader of the cattlemen. Hey, Paul! Snapper Sloan got away, but he dropped this. He hands his father a bundle of clothes. Trent examines them carefully. Hey, a set of duds like Katie's. Well, I reckon Rogers was right about Snapper posing to scarecrow Katie on the raids. All right, let's go, men. But Roy stops him. Hey, wait, wait. Let me go after Snapper and his pal alone. One man has a better chance to trail him. A short time later, last picture, some distance from the mountain hideout, Pete, the cattleman who escaped with Snapper Sloan, looks back over his shoulder. Hey, Snapper, that looks like Roger's trailing us. How are we going to stop him? Snapper looks back. 
and pulls his gun out of his holster, drops back a little behind Pete, and then slugs him on the head. Like this! Uh. Oh, I'm glad that those farmers who attacked Roy's hideout realized that old man Katie and Roy are not to blame for their troubles. So am I. But why did Snapper's little knock his friend Pete's subconscious that way? Well, he hopes that Roy will stop to examine Pete's body. And then that'll give Snapper time to escape. That's what he hopes. Well, I wonder if it'll work. Well, we'll find out about that next week. Now let's go across the page, turn that page over, and there on page seven is Donald Duck. Oh, my favorite, favorite, Donald Duckle. And I'll read your favorite, favorite right away. Here we go with Donald Duckle. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze them, squeeze them, squiggly chicka chat. Let's have music to fit a quack quack. Today, Donald's grandmother, Donald, and Donald's nephews are to have dinner at Daisy Duck's house, Donald's girlfriend. Second picture, they ring her doorbell. Daisy greets them. Well, welcome right in. Dinner will be ready soon. Grandma answers. Smells good. Hope it tastes as well. Third picture, they all troop out into the kitchen. The boys see a freshly baked cake on the kitchen table. Dewey says, Oh, boy, chocolate. May we lick the frosting pan? Daisy answers, Why, sure, boys. Whereupon Grandma says, Indeed not. Never a sweet before the meat, remember? The boys turn around and stomp out of the kitchen. Donald shouts, Ah, where are you going, boys? Oh, we're being pushed around. Last picture, top row, Daisy opens the oven door to look at the turkey that is roasting. Grandma takes one look at it. Land's sake, this bird hasn't been basted half enough. Well, baste it all you like, Grandma. I'll make the gravy. First picture, bottom row, Daisy starts to make the gravy. Grandma takes one look at the spoonful of flour that Daisy has measured out. What? Making gravy with unsifted flour? Give me that spoon. Donald sees Daisy throw down the spoon and stomp out of the room. Hi, you're going someplace? Yes, to the movies. Lock up when you leave. Third picture bottom row, Donald turns to Grandma, who is basting the turkey. Wow, wow, wow. Looks just like you and me. Daisy went to a movie. What? A hostess has walked out? And Grandma walks out of the room, grabs her hat, and heads for the door. I'm heading for the farm. And a little later, we see Donald alone in the kitchen with the dog. And he has served himself and the dog generous portions of the turkey. And Donald says, Eat up, pal. I'm not dining alone. Oh, my. <laughs> Donald's grandma certainly caused a lot of trouble. Yes, yeah, she certainly did. She's bossy. Ooh, very bossy. I'm glad my grandmother isn't like that. And I'm glad my grandmother isn't like that. Well, that's one time that Donald came out ahead, though. Yes, he did, didn't he? Yeah. Well, now let's turn over the page and see who's there. Oh, look. Here on the last page of the first section is Flash Gordon. Oh, yes, Flash Gordon. And I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the last page of the first section, Flash Gordon. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Rigga digga doon doon, saskimatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> on the moon base, the space pirate Mark had slipped into the moon station when Flash was gone and captured Zarkov and Dale. Flash had hurried to the underground hangar, hoping to trap Mark. Not seeing him there, he's gone through the underground tunnel. As he enters the moon station from the tunnel, Mark steps out from behind a pillar, firing his electro gun. <coughs> Flash stumbles backwards, firing his rocket pistol wildly. Mark runs forward. He slams the trap door shut and shouts to his henchmen. All right, Gordon's trapped. He'll head for the underground hangar at the other end of the tunnel. Get over there fast and head him off. Last picture, top row. Flash recovers enough to dash down the tunnel into the pit where his rocket ship is. He grabs a dangling cable and swings himself upward toward the entrance of the cabin of his spaceship. A 
As he climbs into the rocket, electro bolts from the pirate's guns beat a tattoo on the ship's hull. First picture bottom row, Flash slams the rocket's airlock shut behind him. One of the pirates shouts, Bring up the moon tractor! We'll blast him with its cannon! But before the pirates can unlimber their heavy weapon, Flash fires the starting rockets of his craft. The hasty takeoff is far from perfect. The ship lurches crazily as it rises from the pit, barely missing a crack up against the massive concrete wall. In the first few seconds of flight, Flash struggles desperately to bring his huge craft under control. Last picture, finally righting the ship. Flash sweeps around in a blazing arc. Maneuvering into position directly above the pirate's tractor, he silences their gun with a terrific blast of rocket exhaust flames. Oh, hooray, hooray. Flash has escaped from the pirates and he's in his own rocket ship now. Yes, you bet he is. And now he has a good chance to attack Mark and the other pirates with his ship. Yes, let's hope he does. You think he'll capture him next week? Well, I'm afraid we'll have to wait until then to find out. But we don't have to wait to read Dagwood and Blondie. And here they are on the first page of the second section. Oh, yes, I wonder what funny thing Dagwood will do today. Well, we'll find out right now. Here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. Rama food, Rama fum, zim zam zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> It's late at night. Dagwood and his neighbor, Herb Woodley, are on their way home. Dagwood says, Oh, we shouldn't have bowled that last game. It's after midnight. Yeah, our wives will be on the war path for sure. A short time later, Herb dashes into Dagwood's house. Hey, Dagwood, my wife's not home. She's left me. Yeah, Blondie's gone too. Oh, what can we do, Herb? Last picture, top row, Dagwood walks into the living room, drops into a chair and sobs. Oh, our wives have left us. Oh, our happy homes are no more. Oh, hey, Dagwood, Dagwood, don't get panic, eh? We'll, uh, we'll write out a list of promises and send it to them, wherever they are. First picture, second row, Herb gets out a sheet of paper and pencil. Uh, first, we'll promise them never to come home late again, ever. Dagwood smiles happily. Yeah, sure. And next, we'll promise never to strew our clothes around the house or throw ashes on the floor. Yeah, and we'll promise to shave every morning and to keep the lawn mowed. And we'll always dry the dishes and wipe our muddy feet. And last picture, second row, Dagwood carried away shouts enthusiastically. Let's promise them each a new fur coat. That'll cleanse it. Yeah, and new hats and a dress apiece. First picture, third row, Herb looks at the four sheets of paper which are covered with writing. And he says, hey, do you realize we've made over 50 promises? Life's going to be terribly grim for us. Yeah, I know, I know. It's going to be horrible, Herb. But we'll have to do it if we want our wives back. Second picture, third row. Blondie and Tootsie Woodley are on their way home. Tootsie Woodley says, Oh, I didn't realize that second feature picture wouldn't be over until one o'clock. Blondie replies, Our husbands are going to be furious when we come in at this hour. They come up the walk to the Bumstead house. Open the door. And I'm met by Dagwood and Herb. Still standing in the door, Tootsie says, Oh, we're very sorry. We admit we were wrong. We beg your forgiveness. Dagwood looks at Herb, and Herb looks at Dagwood. And they both go, I've just been to the movies. First picture, bottom row, Dagwood stomps the floor in rage. This is an outrage! Coming in at this hour! And Herb clenches his fist. You should be ashamed. Tootsie covers her eyes with her handkerchief to get ready to cry. Blondie looks at the table and says, What are these papers? Tootsie looks up and reads the first line. And the second. And the third. Why, it's a big list of promises to us. And Blondie is reading the last page. Fur coat. Hat. Oh, life is going to be a dream for us. Oh, we're lucky to have such wonderful husbands. And all the while, Herb last picture is staring at Dagwood with a frown on his face. And then he goes... Herb, stop! Herb, stop! But Herb has Dagwood on the floor and is throttling him. I'll teach you not to get so panicky hereafter. 
<laughs> Isn't that funny? Dagwood and Herb got so worried because their wives went home and they wrote out all those promises. <laughs> and then when the wives come in, they don't have sense enough to put the papers in their pockets. <laughs> oh, what a joke on those silly men. <laughs> yeah, that was some joke on them. No wonder Herb's mad. Dagwood got carried away too much, I'm afraid. <laughs> yes, Dagwood got carried away too much, I'm afraid. Well, now it's time for Dick's adventure. So let's go to the very last page of the second section. Oh, yes. And there's Dick, and you remember that Dick was dreaming that he was in the early days of America in Texas. Yes, and Texas was ruled by Mexico and a cruel Mexican general named General Santa Ana. And the Texans are trying to get their freedom from Mexico, and one of the leaders of the Texans is a man named Jim Bowie. And Jim and Dick have been captured by the Mexicans. And when the Americans heard about it, that is the Texans, you know, they rose up in arms and came to attack the soldiers who were going to execute Dick and Bowie. But the Mexicans had put up cannons, and the soldiers were all ready to shoot Dick and Bowie. I wonder if the people will save them in time. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Dick's adventure. Say the magic words with me. Riggedy pack, pack kazak, kazak, kazik. That's, That's the music, music for Adventurous Dick. Dick and Jim face the firing squad. The officer raises his sword. Dick stares straight ahead, waiting for the click of the trigger. When suddenly... Caramba! Vamos! Vamos! The soldiers turn and start to run. Dick looks around. Hey, what's happened? Bowie smiles grimly. Take a look at the stone wall behind you, Dick. Dick turns around to see first picture, second row, the wall alive with armed Texans who come leaping down and set off in pursuit of the enemy soldiers. Texas and Liberty! The resistance of the Mexicans is short-lived. The Texans triumph. And last picture, second row, in the plaza of San Antonio, a flag is hoisted. The old Spanish province of Texas is declared a free and sovereign nation east of the Rio Grande and west of the United States. As Dick looks at the leaders, first picture, bottom row, five citizens of the new Texan Commonwealth impress Dick most. Davy Crockett, Sam Houston... Jim Bowie, young Bill Travis, and Stephen Austin. They were the brains and the inspiration that led the way in accomplishing the freedom of Texas. One morning, second picture, bottom row. Bowie wakes Dick up. Hey, bad news, lad. I just heard that General Santa Ana's government is setting up a big army to wipe us out. And last picture, with a few days' supplies, Dick and Bowie ride out to reconnoiter. They come to the Rio Grande, and there they stop and wait tensely. Oh, isn't it wonderful that the Texans arrived just in the nick of time? You bet they saved Dick's life. And made Texas free. Yes, they did. But I wonder if General Santa Ana is coming to attack, if they, if they will stay free. Well, we'll find out more about that next week. Now look below Dick's adventure. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes. And I'm anxious to read that because you remember last week, Rusty broke into the attic of the Dooley house and he found Miss Dooley was sick in bed and locked up there. Yes, she was locked up there by the man and woman named Mel and Trixie who had told Rusty that they were the hired man and Miss Dooley. And when Rusty ran downstairs to call a doctor, just as he picked up the phone, Mel came in the room and caught him with the phone in his hand. I wonder what's going to happen to Rusty. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Rusty hangs up the phone. Mel says, Who are you going to call on that phone, kid? Well, well, I was just going to try to get a doctor for Miss Dooley. She's awful sick. So, you've been snooping up in the attic, huh? Well, that wasn't healthy. Get in that room. There's no stalling. Rusty walks into the living room. Trixie is standing by the table. It's a good thing you're back, Trixie. This nosy kid's been talking to you-know-who up there in the attic. What'll we do with him? Trixie tells Mel to lock Rusty up while they decide what to do. Last picture top row, Rusty exclaims, But, but, but I wasn't snooping. I, I was just on the roof trying to fix the radio antenna, and, and I heard Miss Dooley moaning. Trixie answers, 
Okay, okay. It doesn't matter how you found out. You know too much now. All right, Mel, take him. We don't have much time. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the town of Honey Hollow, Jim Woods, the storekeeper, has been wondering why Miss Dooley has not come into town recently and why she's always had somebody else cash her checks for her. Jim has come to the bank to talk to the bank president about this. First picture, bottom rule. The banker is saying, uh, Jim, uh, <clears throat> here are all Miss Dooley's checks for the last quarter. They seem to be in order. At least the signatures are genuine. Jim answers, Well, it's uh, not really my business, Sam. It just seems downright odd that she never comes to town. Yeah, and it's queer that all the checks were cashed at stores and here at the bank. Unless... But I always liked the old lady. I'm really quite worried, Sam. Jim, let's take a little run out to Dooley's farm. Right, Sam. I think it'd be smart to pick up the sheriff on the way. At this moment, last picture, at the farm, Trixie and Mel are packing. Trixie tells Mel that while she puts the stuff in the station wagon, he knows what to do with the old lady and the kid that they should be out of the country before anybody finds them. And Mel replies grimly, where I'm going to put them, it'll be sheer luck if they're ever found. Oh, I'm glad that banker and Jim Wood are going to go out to the farm. Yes, so am I, because if Rusty ever needed help, he needs it now. Yes, but, but do you think that they'll get there before Mel does something awful to Rusty? Well, that's something we'll find out next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right, Mr. Tommy Wheatley Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week. When I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. <laughs>